Welcome to Columbia at Home, the CAA's webinar series. We're so glad you've joined us. I'm Donna McPhee. I graduated from Columbia College in 1989, and I'm the current Vice President for Alumni Relations at the University and President of the CAA. I'm wearing Columbia blue today because today was the university's commencement. Congratulations to the over 11,000 students who graduated and have joined our alumni community. Um, it was a special day and I wanna give a shout out to the class and mention that all of you as alumni joined us from the CAA to give a gift to the class of 2020. What we decided to do was to give them something that would be memorable and that would last. We collaborated with two Colombians, composer Tom Kitt, who wrote a song that was sung by a former student, Ben Platt. If you didn't get to listen it, to it today, I encourage you to look in your inbox, I sent you an email, or visit our YouTube channel. It's a wonderful song, it celebrates Columbia, and it celebrates a, our community at such an unprecedented time. So now let's turn to tonight. Tonight's program is Creating the Perfect Cookie with Greg Rails, founder of the Red Gate Bakery in New York City. He is a member of the Columbia College class of 2012, and he will be joined in conversation with Patricia Howard, the Red Gate's Director of Operations and a 2013 graduate of the college as well. Red Gate Bakery is an intimate bake shop nestled in Manhattan's East Village. Named after the idyllic Nantucket farm where Rails spent summers growing up, Redgate was inspired by his fond memories baking in his swim trunks on warm afternoons. What initially started as a simple wholesale business headquartered in Rails' home quickly gained a cult following. After outgrowing his kitchen, Redgate Bakery found a new home in the East Village where he and Patricia opened the first brick and mortar location in 2019. Rails gleans inspiration from the baked goods of his childhood, reimagining them with unique and unexpected ingredients. The pastries, which range from cookies to loaves to celebration cakes, are crafted with premium ingredients and ably walk the line between familiar and sophisticated, satisfying any and all sweet teeth. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have. I'm now pleased to welcome Greg and Patricia to Columbia at Home. Enjoy. Hey everyone, welcome to my home kitchen. Uh, I am wearing a white t-shirt because the rest of my laundry is dirty. Uh, and my name is Greg Rails, and I graduated from Columbia College in 2012, like Donna said, thank you very much. And I founded Redgate Bakery last December. <clears throat> We've opened and obviously since shut down, but we had a great first three months and we're looking to get back up and running as, as soon as possible. And tonight we're gonna be making our choco toffee cookies, which is a perfect update on an already perfect cookie. Please don't at me grammar teachers. But uh, let's get started. We're gonna start by browning some butter, which is something that we do a lot at the bakery. It lends a really intense depth of flavor to our otherwise pretty simple baked goods and really turns a, the volume up on, on a really familiar baked good already, the chocolate chip cookie, of course. And so that's what we're all about, it's taking everything that is really accessible and familiar that you ate growing up, growing up excuse me, and uh, just changing one or two things to, to make your head tilt a little bit to the side and, and say, hey, what's in that? So. Let's get started now. I've got some great A2, really delicious yellow butter melting in this saucepan right here. We're gonna boil this at a pretty high heat, get things cranking up here um, until it starts to bubble pretty aggressively. And then it's gonna boil for about five minutes. Um, and then after that happens, our bubbling is gonna slow down a little bit and you're gonna start smelling a really nutty, toasty aroma that smells really, really good. And it's gonna make you want to do ungodly things, but you shouldn't, and you should put these into these cookies. Um, the milk solids and butter, when butter boils, the fat separates from the milk solids. And as those milk solids cook inside of the fat, they deep fry essentially in butter, uh, they start to toast a little bit. And that's where the brown comes from in brown butter. And 
It's a beautiful application on sweet and savory things. Um, but when you have something that's really simple as these cookies are, uh, it adds a, a depth of flavor and a really sort of intense uh, punch that you can't quite recognize, but is incredibly addictive and keeps you coming back for more. So we have got our butter bubbling away here. Um, and another great thing about this recipe is that it, you don't need a hand mixer. It's perfect for quarantine cooking if you don't have a stand mixer. Um, everything comes together in about five minutes, especially once after this, this butter is, is done browning. And you can have cookies in 20 minutes flat. And everyone has butter, sugar, flour. We have a little bit of, of toffee going into these two, which adds a, a really nice je ne sais quoi um, to these cookies and, and sort of adds a, a really lovely buttery richness to everything. Uh, but other than that, these are cookies that everyone knows, everyone loves, um, but with, with a little twist that, that we think uh, just sort of turns them up a notch. So I don't know if you can hear, but we've got our, our butter bubbling away pretty aggressively now. Let's get this turned over this way. And even already, I can start to smell sort of that browning going on, that Maillard reaction. The brown food tastes good. When you take a, a steak, for instance, and you sear it at a very high heat in a pan, you get that really rich brown crust. That's another good example of the Maillard reaction. That is toasting and changing the flavor of what already exists in whatever you're cooking. And this is a really simple version to do uh, a pretty advanced chemical reaction inside of a piece of food. So that's what we're doing when we brown our butter. We have brown butter in these cookies. We do a brown butter blondie as well. And we have a toasted carrot loaf, which also is loaded with brown butter. So that's, if you're sensing a theme here, that's definitely going on. Um, and I just, the first time I had it, I knew that I had to put it in everything. It's it, important to use brown butter, I think, in, uh, in pretty simple desserts or in pretty simple dishes so that flavor can really be showcased. And that's, this is a, a perfect blank canvas for, for uh, this really special type of, of cookie. So as that browns, I'm gonna put our sugars into our, our big bowl. We're gonna have a, one big mixing bowl where we'll put everything together. I've got a lot of brown sugar here and a little bit of white sugar. I always like to use dark brown sugar because there's more molasses in that than there is in, uh, in light brown sugar and it sort of blends itself really well to A, the toffee we're going to add to this and B, of course, that sort of warm, uh, spiced, sort of wonderful tasting brown butter. So that's why we've got some dark brown sugar here. And as you use brown sugar over white sugar, you're going to get more of a chew and a, and a sort of a, a stretchier, pullier cookie than you would if you use just, uh, just regular sugars. Think, for example, like a sugar cookie, which would definitely be, be wonderful with brown butter added to it. But those cookies are sort of, they, they dry up and they're pretty solid when, at room temperature, but these are going to stay soft for a couple of days and, and be really, really unctuous. So I can sort of hear that the, the butter here is slowing down. And now I'm swirling it around because you don't want to, once the butter starts to brown, it can burn very, very quickly. So you want to take it off the heat once you start, use your nose. Once you start smelling, mm, it smells delicious. Once you start smelling those, those milk solids toasting up, you can really uh, go too far too quickly. So, so once you start smelling, start taking it off the heat a little bit and swirling it around. Hopefully you can see this. The things in here are getting very, very brown and very nutty and delicious. And I'm gonna go ahead and add this to our sugars slowly because we're working with hot fat here. We don't wanna burn anyone or anything. So we're done here. And like I said, this all comes together by hand. It's really super easy and super adaptable. So anything that you can find in, in, your, in your pantry right now, there aren't really any special ingredients that you need for this. But just wanna move this around, start to cool the butter down a little bit get all of our sugars mixed together. Pretty straightforward. Looks and smells delicious already though. So, I mean, if someone gave a piece of toast to me and put this on it, I definitely wouldn't complain. But you just want to keep it moving around, cool it down, get some of the sugar to start to, to dissolve a little bit. I can feel this bowl already that it's already cooled off significantly now that I've got it moving around. So now we have that done, we're gonna add 
two eggs and a teaspoon of vanilla extract for flavor. Get these guys moving around in here. Immediately, you're going to see the mixture lighten. And as you incorporate more air into the cookies, it's gonna lighten a little bit further. And at this point, the texture of, of this butter, sugar, and eggs is going to start pulling away from the size of the bowl a little bit and actually start looking like toffee itself. Wow, it like, smells really, really, really good. Once those are all combined, we can switch to a spatula because we're gonna start adding our dry ingredients. And I'm sure everyone here has heard about gluten a lot in the past five, 10 years. Um, we, once we add our dry ingredients into this, we want to mix as little as possible. When you are making bread or pizza dough, for example, you need your dough, you want to develop long strands of gluten, that protein in there to give you a nice chewy bite on something like a bagel, a pizza crust, like I said, and, and good bread. We want cookies to be nice and tender and delicate, the same way we want cakes and any sort of pastry. So when we add our all-purpose flour here, we are going to want to mix things as little as possible. So just into this bowl, I'm going to add two cups of all-purpose flour, easy peasy, and a teaspoon of baking soda, and a teaspoon of kosher salt. If you don't have kosher salt and you just have table salt, it's fine. We're gonna sprinkle these with some, some flaky salt at the end and they're gonna be wonderfully sweet, salty, savory, all those good things. So now I'm just gonna take this and like I said, without overmixing, just fold all of these ingredients together and you're gonna start getting what resembles a bit of a shaggy dough as you keep folding and mixing, folding and mixing, just until things really come together. Spatula is a baker's favorite tool. It's just, it does anything. It's like you can mix, you can shove it underneath the door as a door jam, you can uh, spread frosting on a cake. It's really just, the perfect multi-purpose tool. But here we go, so we've got this lovely little toffee colored homogenous mixture now, which looks pretty dope if you ask me. We're gonna sort of add our chocolate now. So another thing that if you're at home right now and you don't have a certain type of chocolate or you only have chocolate chips or you only have butterscotch chips, whatever, anything at this point you can add to this cookie is gonna taste delicious, let's be honest. So what I have here is some really lovely, dark, bittersweet chocolate, 70% cacao. Um, it's got a really sort of rich flavor, which is gonna balance really well with this very sweet dough. So I just chopped up about eight ounces of, of uh, chocolate here that I'm gonna put in. And once again, just fold until combined. So we get our chocolate in here. I like using chopped chocolate because you get all these irregular chunks and some of the really fine pieces start to melt in the dough already and sort of infuse the cookie itself with chocolate and the bigger pieces sort of melt as we, we bake and create these really really delicious big puddles of chocolate so i don't know if you can see but we've got these streaks of chocolate going on here which make me very hungry and then of course we're going to add our toffee so these are little bits of score toffee bars that we put into our cookies too. They're really, they glisten a lot after they bake. My first memory of these is, uh, I don't know if anyone else is familiar with Mrs. Fields butter toffee cookies, but not until I started using score bits in these cookies did I realize that that's what they've been using this whole time. And I was very grateful for that. So we've got this cookie dough done, which is flecked with chocolate and deep and nutty and, oh, smells really good. And that's literally it. This is a really simple, really easy cookie that you can put together so quickly. If you have nuts and you want to throw them in here, that's great. You can toast those up beforehand. If you have a different kind of candy that you want to use or a different type of chocolate, as I mentioned, throw those in here. Once the, the dough is put together with the dry ingredients, it is truly a blank canvas and you can do whatever you want to it. So now that this is all assembled, we are going to scoop our cookies. If we were at the bakery right now, to be quite frank, we would probably let this rest in the fridge for about a day. Um, there is some argument about how long to rest cookies once they've been assembled due to the flour rehydrating and producing a, a more stable and sort of solid mass. Because this butter is still a little bit warm, these cookies will spread a lot. So keep that in mind when you're scooping them onto a sheet. But if you were to leave them in the fridge for say 24 hours and scoop them after then, 
they'd spread less and the flavor would be probably a little bit more developed, but I don't care. I want to eat them in 10 minutes. So got our handy dandy scoop. This is a two ounce scoop. This is what we use at the bakery. Uh, you can use two tablespoons if you want. You can use a four ounce scoop, an ice cream scoop, whatever you have on hand, it doesn't matter. Just know that whatever scoop you use is the cookie that you're going to get. And I like a big cookie. So I am going to take just big level scoops of this, place them onto a, whoops, onto a cookie sheet about two inches apart. As I mentioned, they will spread a lot since the, the fat inside of this is still warm. But I think that there's nothing wrong with a lovely, thin, lacy chocolate chip cookie, which these are going to become. Awesome. We've got our, our sheet tray there. And as I mentioned before, we're now gonna sprinkle these with a little mm, flaky Malden sea salt, which is, is a really delicate uh, sort of these crystals. I don't know if you can see, I'll show this in my hand, but you can see that there are really big crystals in this salt. They're harvested by hand and the flavor is not abrasive like a table salt would be at a restaurant, uh, but it's really sort of delicate and tastes like the sea, to be frank. So I'm just gonna take a little pinch of these for each cookie and sprinkle them evenly over the top. So when you bite into this, you get that big nuttiness from the brown butter, a hit of chocolate and sweetness from the toffee and that really wonderful salty finish. So this is what my cookie dough looks like. If yours looks a little bit different, it's probably gonna be even better than these. So do not fret. These are going to go into the oven for about 12 to 14 minutes at 350 degrees. And then we're going to have a lot of really good cookies on our hands. So into my little oven. 12 minutes on the timer. And now that those are in there, I would like to welcome my wonderful business partner, Patricia Howard, CC13. We're going to ask a few baking questions and, and uh, talk about how Redgate started. Hi, Greg, and hi, everyone joining us from kitchens around the world. Um, oh, yeah. Hope some of you are starting to smell brown butter, but based on the chat, we have a lot of people behind. That's not okay. to worry. Um, we'll talk through it. Yeah, I think we should start at the top and just go slowly. A lot of people didn't have the ingredients ahead of time. Um, but I'm sending I just sent the ingredients in the chat, so I hope everyone can see that. And the steps are coming also. Um, talk, why don't I talk through it one more time right now? Is that, is that yeah, okay? Yeah, perfect. Yes, so and I'll more, send more... steps. Sorry for speeding through that, everyone. I've obviously made these cookies more than a few times. Uh, but the most advanced technique that we're doing here is, as I mentioned at the top, browning the butter. So you want to take your two sticks of butter, put them in a, in a saucepan on your stove, and at first, crank the heat up pretty high. You want to get the butter melted. You want to get it bubbling. You want to get it boiling pretty aggressively. And after about two or three minutes of doing that, we want to crank the, the heat down a little bit. You'll notice the bubbling slow down a lot. You'll notice some foam rising to the top of your butter. And shortly after that, that's when you should really start using your nose. You're going to start smelling tons and tons of that nuttiness. Oh, God, it's so good. I still smell it in my kitchen now. Um, and once you start smelling that, then you can take it off the heat because as I mentioned, it's going to go south pretty quickly from there. But once you take it off the heat, throw it into your bowl with your two sugars and just move that stuff around. You wanna get the sugar dissolving a little bit. You wanna get the butter cooling down because of course we're about to add eggs and we don't want an omelet, we want cookies. So you wanna keep that butter moving around and as you keep it moving, it, the mixture should start to become a little bit more homogenous. Use your hands, use your nose, like I said, feel the bottom of the bowl. To, to see the temperature of, of your butter and your sugar and how that's, that's coming together. And once you sort of feel it's a, a little cooler down, a little closer to room temperature, it does not have to be cool, but closer to room temperature, you can add your eggs. That way they won't scramble, like I said. And that's when you wanna mix a little more aggressively. The butter, sugar, and eggs will start to come together and look like toffee sauce almost. It's going to start pulling away from the side of the bowl and that's when you know that you're ready to add your dry ingredients. So we've got our flour, our baking soda, and our salt that you can just dump on top of that <clears throat> and slowly mix together just until it comes together and forms this really lovely loose 
uh, and, and caramelly looking cookie dough. At that point, the world is your oyster. I like to use the chocolate, that bittersweet chocolate, like I mentioned, and the toffee bits. But I know Trader Joe's makes a really great chocolate covered toffee bar. And so you can double your, your chocolate amount that way. That, that's really great. Um, I've made this with Snickers, to be frank. I made this with a lot of different candy bars that we don't need to go through, but I made it with a lot of candy. Um, I've thrown toasted pistachios in there, toasted almonds. Um, any sort of mixing that you can think of is really, really delicious. Um, and from there, you just sort of scoop to the size of your liking and throw them in the oven. I think if you use two tablespoons and made smaller cookies, you can probably shave two or three minutes off the baking time. Like I said, we use a uh, two ounce scoop, which is sort of a, a, a small looking ice cream scoop, I would say. Um, and those bake for about 12 to 14 minutes, depending on your oven at 350 degrees. Um, or if you're trying to feed a crowd, I've made this with four ounce scoops with six ounce scoops, which is really aggressive, but really delicious. Um, and it's, you can't lose. So you're gonna have a delicious cookie. Just once eight, nine minutes starts passing, just keep an eye on it and, and you're gonna have a, a winning texture overall. Excellent, thank you. Um, so a few other clarifying questions from people. Sure. Um, can you talk about how you know the butter is browned enough so you can avoid burning it? I really think your senses are perfect here. Use your nose, let that aroma sort of fill your kitchen. The moment that, that signature smell, which you'll know because it's not gonna be something, if you're not familiar with brown butter, it's not gonna be a smell that, that you've smelled before. Once that sort of hits your nostrils, pull it off the heat. It can be tough if you're using sort of a smaller saucepan and the butter starts to foam up right as it begins to brown and you can't see the bottom of the pan quite as much. I probably didn't show that as, as clearly as I could have, but it can be tough to see where it's actually browning. So then you can sort of get into burnt territory, but your nose is really, really key here. It's, it's the best tool you can use. Um, and is it a tablespoon or a teaspoon of vanilla extract? Uh, I'm honestly going to leave that up to you. I like vanilla a lot. If you put a tablespoon in, it's going to be really delicious and really luxurious tasting, but a teaspoon is what we use at the bakery and uh, definitely gives that sort of punch of vanilla, that, that, that aroma that sort of permeates the cookie after you get to the brown butter and the chocolate and the toffee. Excellent. Um, what about people wanting to make this gluten-free? Do you have any recommendations? We are a full fat, full dairy, all gluten bakery. So after I roll my eyes at you, which I promise is in jest and love only, I would suggest Cup for Cup AP uh, gluten-free flour. That's I think a Thomas Keller brand. It has the best structure of any gluten-free flours that are out there um, and provides the most consistent results. I think it comes in a, in a big blue bag and then there's a measuring cup on the front of the bag. Um, I wouldn't try this with like a nut flour or with uh, like an oat flour. There just isn't enough structure in those flours itself. And what you'll have is delicious, but they'll really pool together and sort of fuse into one like Franken cookie, which I don't know, that sounds pretty good now that I'm mentioning it out loud, so. Um, all right, fielding lots of questions. Um, Dairy-free recommendations? Um, these would be delicious with coconut oil, to be honest. You'd obviously get a, a bit of an undercurrent of coconut flavor with those, but coconut oil is often a very good uh, dairy sub for butter um, and provides a pretty good, uh, it burns at a high temperature, so it, it cooks and browns similarly to butter. Um, I think that's definitely what I would do. But in any case, you, if, if you want to use something dairy-free and you don't want to use coconut oil, I would use an oil that is solid at room temperature. Um, just because if it's liquid, your, your cookies are going to be liquid at room temperature. Right. Um, what about the type of flour that you used? You touched on gluten-free flour, but other full gluten flours, um, do you have a preference? What about bleached, unbleached, organic, non-organic? We use unbleached AP flour at the bakery. It's uh, the most untreated and has the best gluten structure. There's a lot of discussion about this. David Light of the New York Times has a very, very famous uh, chocolate chip cookie recipe that has been in the, in the Times for a long time. He uses half uh, bread flour and half, um, half cake flour, I think. Uh, I don't find a lot of, uh, I don't know, purpose in doing that because when you add those two flours together, their protein content, which is what all these different flours vary in, um, sort of evens about to be the same as AP flour. So I just sort of shoot down the middle and, and use AP, but 
If you only have bread flour on hand because you've been making a lot of sourdough during this time, that's fine. Your cookie is going to be a little stretchier and a little chewier uh, because of that protein structure. Um, if you use like a, a double zero flour, like a pasta flour that's very, very light and delicate, similar to a cake flour, your, your cookie is going to be a little puffier and it's, like I said, it's going to have a little less structure, so it's going to spread a little bit more. Got it. Um, what about the type of butter that you use? Do you know where you got that? And do you have, you know, butter advice for others? Um, I am a fan of expensive butter. I'm a fan of cheap butter. I do not care. I just use that because that's what I had in my fridge. I uh, got some from a restaurant supplier at the beginning of quarantine, and I've been moving through my butter pretty, pretty slowly, thankfully, for my waistline. But uh, the butter that I had just now was really gorgeous and like deep yellow. If you if you're familiar with Kerrygold butter, which is available in most supermarkets these days, um, that's a similar type of vibe. That's an Irish butter, and the fat content in that is higher, uh, just like European butter is too. <clears throat> so it's gonna have a really rich yellow flavor. I'm a sucker for color, I suppose. So I I, I like the the H E butter that I used. Um, is there a reason in the bakery we use the chunks of chocolate versus chips? Do you have a, do you swing one uh, there's way? A, there's a, a quantity factor going on there, but we do chop our chocolate too. So depending on my mood, I suppose. So I'll see what, what cookies that I use. But I do, like, like I said, I do like chopping the chocolate to be frank, because I find that the really small dusty bits you get from that end up melting into the cookie and making the cookie base itself really chocolatey. And that, that really gets me going. Um... What about... Just take a peek at these quickly. Yes. Ooh. Smells really good in here. I can't lie. They need about two more minutes. Do they're you spreading. know if there are, what are the significant differences from Nestle's Toll House recipe um, versus your version? I think there are two main differences. The first is, of course, that we brown our butter. We don't cream it together um, and the cookie is a little denser because of that. When you make a cake, it's much more important to cream your your fat and your sugar together when you're making a cake because you're looking for a really fluffy, light crumb at the end of the day. With a cookie, it's not as important because the, the structure and, and the, the texture once it's baked isn't going for, the, for that same vibe. But <clears throat> we uh, we put everything together by hand and it's it's a really fast, easy, simple way to, to get things going. If someone did want to use creamed butter versus instead of browning the butter for the Redgate recipe, could you follow all the same measurements but cream the butter rather than brown it? Absolutely. This recipe is incredibly forgiving and incredibly adaptable. Um, what you do is, is what you would, would start most cookies and cakes with and with your, either by hand if you're very strong or with the stand mixer or a hand mixer, cream together, your, you want room temperature butter, Cream that together with your uh, with your sugars, and and then follow the recipe from there. I didn't quite finish answering the last question. I'm just realizing now. But the second main difference between our recipe and the Toll House recipe is we err on the side of of brown sugar much more than granulated sugar. Um, I think there's more granulated sugar in, than brown in the in the Toll House recipe. But because we're looking for that really stretchy, molassesy, wonderful texture, I always opt for brown sugar. We do use it in a few buttercreams too, which adds sort of that rich uh, sort of caramelly flavor. Um, I think it's, it's, it's substitutable for, for white sugar in any recipe, whether people know that or not, but it's really, really delicious. Got it. Um, what about, do you have any experience cooking with ghee? Could you use ghee instead of butter? Ghee is delicious um, and it is great because the milk solids have been removed from the butter. And so your butter, you can get that really delicious, rich, buttery flavor, but use it at higher heat cooking. Unfortunately, because those milk solids are gone, ghee will not brown. Don't use ghee for this recipe, please. Um, you're not gonna get that same sort of unctuousness that, that brown butter provides. Uh, if you're in a pinch and that's all you have, of course, try that. It's gonna be, be similar to if you just cream the, the butter and the sugar together rather than browning it first. Um... Is the, the timing and the temperatures that you gave are for regular home ovens, not convection or? Regular home ovens at 350. If you're cooking at convection, you always want to lower your temperature from a recipe about 25 degrees. If you're 
baking at altitude, you want to increase your temperature by about 25 degrees. Um, obviously, since one of those ovens is cooler than the other, you want to adjust your baking time accordingly as well. So if you're baking at a cooler temperature, add two or three minutes to this cookie recipe. If you're baking at a higher temperature at altitude, take away two or three minutes from the recipe. That's going to help with the, the structure and the leavening that's going on inside of your cookie. Um, what pan, what brand is the pan that you use to melt the butter? Uh, I think this is an all clad. It is. Yeah, this is an all clad set that I got, I think when I graduated college. Um, you can sort of see a little bit more here. There are a few brown butter solids at the bottom of this pan. This is what you want to go for. I like to take it pretty close to burning because I think the flavor is more intense. Um, I've obviously done this more than a few times, so I wouldn't recommend trying that in the first time out. But um, yeah, this is a four quart all clad saucepan. I've got a two quart as well. They're great for making pasta, for making sauce, uh, for heating anything up really. Um, do you ever put shortening in your cookie recipes? How do you think that affects the cookies? Shortening is, is more solid at room temperature than butter is. It's a little less pliable. Um, shortening is good for our Oreo filling, in fact, um, for that exact reason. So the filling doesn't smush out. Um, shortening doesn't have any flavor, so I don't prefer to use it in, in any sort of recipe, at least as the primary fat. But um, in a pinch, it'll work. Of course it does. It's been used for, I don't know, a billion years now. So let me check on these cookies. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. These are great. I like to wrap the pan a little bit, sort of get that, those crinkly edges going, but let me not burn myself. Let me show you how these are looking. They're nice and sort of crinkled on top. You can see uh, the, the salt that's, that we sprinkled on top. The chocolate is melting. It's sort of irregular in places. It smells amazing. You can smell a lot of that molasses and the brown sugar. Um, and they spread quite a bit, so they're nice and big. And I don't know, maybe I'll make ice cream sandwiches with these tonight. I'm not sure, but they look really, really good for that. So these are our, excuse me, our uh, chocolate toffee recipes. So we'll let those Can cool you, down for a bit. For a bit, go ahead, please. Um, I see that you have parchment paper on the baking sheet. Um, if you just sprayed. Would that be okay with like Pam or put a little butter on the pan or a silly, like a silicone pat? A few things. Talk about we, we, you know, we, always, we always use parchment in the bakery because it's the easiest removal. Um, you're not going to get anything to stick to your pan if you have that going for you. So that, that's great. And that's what I like using at home too. Um, in a pinch, cooking spray, butter, any sort of other fat slipped onto the baking sheet would be great too. Um, you're probably not gonna get any sticking. There's a lot of butter in these, so they don't really wanna stick to anything in general. Um, as for silpats, silpats are great for, for making candy, for making anything that is like really intensely sticky and it's gonna destroy whatever you put on your pan unless you have something beneath that. I don't like it for cookies because I find that it inhibits browning a little bit. And I have some cookies that I made earlier too. And you can see from the bottom of these, like, look at that. That is the same sort of Maillard reaction you're getting when you're browning butter, when you're browning all these cookies. You want a really toasty, rich uh, cookie at the end of the day. And with a Silpat, you're just going to, it'll cook, but you're just going to sort of have a, a pale bottom and, and that's going to be no good. Um, and the type of chocolate that you use, do you have brand yes. preferences? I used a Scharfenberger chocolate bar that I chopped up just now, which is 70%, I think I, I mentioned. Um, Guitar is, is, a, is a great uh, brand that's in most supermarkets these days. I mean, Toll House chocolate chip cookie, chocolate chips rather, are, are perfectly acceptable and really delicious. Um, I would say if you use a chocolate chip, they usually have some stabilizers inside of them that prevent them from melting as much. So when your cookies come out of the oven, you can sort of see that really perfect chip inside of them. If you use a chopped bar or if you use, if you get really fancy and using like Valrona Fevs, those sort of oblong discs, um, those are gonna melt really deliciously and you're gonna get like really mm, gooey puddles of chocolate. Do you usually cool your cookies on a, transfer them to a cookie, a cooling rack? I would put this rack, I just put it on my stove over here. Um, something that, that there's some air circulation beneath them for sure. Um, but you can let them cool completely on, on the pan. They're probably gonna crumble if you try to move them before their the room temperature. But I mean, if you have a bunch of cookie crumbles, they're gonna, 
they'll cool off for, for about 15, 20 minutes, I'd say, before they're really, really movable. If you want them uh, totally at room temperature, I'd give them another 15 after that for about a half an hour total, but I'm not gonna wait that long either, so sorry. And um, can you repeat what you were talking about, um, letting them chill overnight in the fridge versus baking sure. them after mixing? So we're obviously putting these together and baking them right away, which results in more spreading, like I mentioned. And overall, the, the flour didn't have time to, to soak up all that butter and, and, and vanilla and sugar that we added to it. <clears throat> if they rest in the fridge a little bit more, you're gonna have a, a taller cookie. And you're gonna have something of, about fl with flavor that's a little more developed than what it is now. Uh, like I said, when, when the dough sits and rests for a little bit, the flour starts to suck up all of those other flavors that you've added to this cookie. And the, the entire cookie itself sort of has a more homogenous developed flavor. These, don't fault me, but you might have a pocket of brown sugar here and a pocket of, of white sugar there. So they're still gonna be really delicious, but if you want a more nuanced sort of fl flavor forward cookie, definitely let it rest for about a day. Um, how many cookies did the, if you follow the size scoop that you did, how many does that yield approximately? That would yield about 12 to 15 cookies with a four ounce scoop from this recipe. If you use a four ounce scoop, which is obviously twice as big, you would yield about half as many cookies. Um, but if you're just sort of scooping along at home with, with two tablespoons, you get how many cookies as, as you get and, and I wouldn't be upset with that. And if you used a smaller scoop, how would that affect the timing of cooking? Uh, we can get into some math here. So if, if uh, I've got a, a two ounce scoop here, if I've got a, a four ounce scoop twice as much, I would probably tack on one and a half times as, as much uh, time and vice versa for, for something that, that's smaller, if I had a one ounce scoop, I'd probably cut that down to about 75% of the time. It's not quite perfect in terms of, of, terms of timing because the, the size is, isn't too variable, but it's important to, once they're in the oven, to again, use your nose and then just take a peek every once in a while. Got it, and if you're storing it in the fridge or freezer, um, how, how would you recommend packing it up? I would covered. Sure, I would let these rest in the, in the fridge for about a day. And then once they come out, let that warm up a little bit so I can scoop them pretty easily. I would then scoop them all onto a sheet tray with lined with parchment, pop that whole thing in the freezer and then wait till those are frozen solid and then throw them in, into a Ziploc bag or a sort of a, a deli container like these, something that's airtight and they'll be good for, for three months and probably more. Um, of course, once things are frozen or if things are coming uh, from the fridge and going into the oven, you wanna add one or two or three minutes to, to the baking time because it's gonna take a little bit longer. Um, and if on the off chance you don't eat all of your cooked, your baked cookies tonight, how should you store them? I, I can't relate to that question at all, but uh, I, th I would just put them in an airtight container, whether that's a Tupperware or like I mentioned, those little deli containers or another Ziploc bag, something that's, that's airtight and is gonna prevent them from, from getting stale more quickly. These have, like I said, a lot of sugar in them. Uh, sugar is a preservative. So when these last at room temperature, I'd say stored tightly for, for three or five days even. Even at that point, once they're stale, like I said, I would just crumble them up and put them over ice cream because they're still gonna be incredibly delicious. Agreed. Um, if someone uh, baking along, her butter didn't give off any aroma when it was boiling and the finished cookies are good, but not <laughs> the brown nutty flavor <laughs> that she was expecting. I think we probably didn't brown our butter enough. Um, after, once the butter is boiling, you wanna wait until that boiling slows. Once it slows, it's gonna start foaming up and then use, that is the point that you will really wanna start using your nose because it's tough to see underneath all that foam if things are actually browning. But you wanna wait until the boiling um, has really almost come to a stop. Um, and then th you, you'll be able to, to start getting that, that brown butter reaction going on. Um, and what rack, what position would you bake these in a home oven? Um, I like to bake in the top third of my oven. I find that's the most consistent part. I've got an oven thermometer, of course. You always wanna use one of those to make sure that uh, everything's running according to plan. But if you've got two sheets in the oven at the same time, if you've got three racks in the oven, I would just rotate everything front to back, top to bottom, halfway through. I think that's the best way to ensure 
uh, even cooking. Everyone's oven has hot spots, so it's no one's fault. Um, and we we got a little carried away with all of the questions from the audience, but do you want to tell um, the Columbia alums around the world a little bit about Redgate, what we have on our menu, uh, how you got started? Uh, yeah, Redgate is all sort of about updated classics. I think I mentioned at, at the top that we take things that are really accessible, like a blondie and a brownie. We've got a salted caramel brownie at the bakery and a brown butter blondie, things that everyone grew up eating, um, but we sort of turn the volume up on one or two ingredients inside of them. So uh, we do a banana bread that uh, is sort of like studded with dark chocolate and has cocoa powder, cocoa powder excuse me, running through it. Uh, that's our midnight banana bread. We've got these blondies that are filled with toasted pecans and a lot of brown butter too, Patricia's favorite, and I think it's growing to become my favorite as well. Um, we've got our burnt chocolate cookie, which is sort of the inverse of this, this cookie. That's a dark chocolate cookie that is loaded with uh, these ribbons of caramelized white chocolate, which is uh, a flavor very similar to brown butter that you get by baking white chocolate actually at a very low temperature over a long period of time and keeping it moving every 10 minutes or so. The, the, I think it's the cocoa butter inside of the, the white chocolate there too starts to cook as well. The color changes, it gets much tanner and beige looking than, than the standard yellow white chocolate. Um, and the flavor is just mm, to die. So those are, are, are my personal favorite cookies, but we've got a, a spice and iced oatmeal cookie that has a, a cinnamon glaze on top that's sort of a riff on a classic oatmeal raisin cookie. Everything that we do is, uh, is, is something that is, is really familiar and accessible, but um, with, with one or two twists added in. And there's nothing wrong with a sprinkling of flaky sea salt on top of any pastry. So we do that a lot too. And, did we and get, how did you sorry, get, I was, get to I think, Redgate? Go ahead. How did we get, get to Redgate? Well, from, from Columbia Creative Writing to, oh, sure. to where you are now. Patricia and I became very good friends uh, one summer when we studied abroad in Paris together. Um, and uh, we quickly learned that we both love food. And um, after college, we'd have dinner dates all the time and we'd cook for each other uh, and realized that, that we both definitely wanted to start a food business at, at one point or, or another in our lives. Um, I think that, that it, the iteration of that business changed more than a few times, but at the end of, uh, not, or at the beginning of last year, rather, we sort of met up and, and realized that, hey, the sort of the timing is right right now. Both of our jobs were, were either sort of ending or ready to, to end soon. And uh, we began hunting for a space. And, and late last fall, we got into our space on First Street, 68 East First Street in the East Village, and had a quick little build out and, and opened right before Christmas. Thank you. Yeah. Do we want to bring uh, Amanda Halleck in? I think, I think she's calling in from uh, uh, West Orange, New Jersey. Amanda Halleck from Columbia College, class of 2012, a wonderful classmate of mine has joined us to ask us a few questions. I have my cookies. They definitely oh, didn't come look out at those, everyone. as good as yes, yours, sure. <laughs> but I tried my best. Um, definitely not as good as the bakery. And I have to say for the record, I do miss my uh, weekly lunch breaks and my walk over to see you and Patricia at Red Gate. We miss you too. Can't wait to come back. Um, obviously, we go, Greg and I go way back um, from the dorms at Columbia. Um, so, Greg, yeah. what, um, and you've baked for us quite a bit over the years, but I don't think I've ever actually asked you, like, what, where do you get your inspiration from? Um, okay, inspiration is a fickle thing because it often doesn't come when you want it to come. But a lot of these recipes stem from things that I made as a kid, as, uh, as Donna mentioned up top. Um, and as I grew up and, and read more food publications and learned more about actually how to cook, I, <clears throat> I learned a lot from the Food Network and from food blogs and from just sort of reading any lit food literature that I could get my hands on. Um, and through doing that, I learned some pretty basic techniques about how to bake and uh, how to sort of extract as much flavor from as few ingredients as possible. And I sort of applied that philosophy to everything that we do at the bakery as well. Um, I think uh, when it comes to new flavor combinations or um, the, a, a new item in general that looks really pretty, I, I 
like to look to seasonal ingredients a lot. Um, I was very much looking forward to opening full speed this spring at the bakery because of all the great fruit and produce that's coming in, that's rounding into season. Um, I hope to do that more this summer uh, as, as the markets keep rolling and we're able to, to slowly open back up. Um, but uh, seasonal produce is, is great. And then when it comes to something that's pretty or, or uh, that looks different. Uh, I rely on art a lot, uh, TV, uh, nature, any sort of place that you're sort of hanging out. I find when I'm not thinking about these things, I'll, I'll get an idea for um, uh, a new item. And then my only other question is, because obviously quarantine times, a lot of people have been picking up baking. I would definitely call myself an amateur baker. I've got my stand mixer that I've been using and it's been really You're fun. At, at least an intermediate, I would say. But it's been, it's been difficult. So what would any amateur baker, like what's one utensil, like one tool or one ingredient that every amateur baker should have in their pantry? I think one, I, I extolled the virtues of spatulas when I was making those cookies. I still do that, especially uh, if you see offset spatulas, I've got, a big version, a big guy here. These are great for um, for lifting cookies off of trays, for frosting cakes, for um, I literally the many versions of these I've, I've used as a, a literal door jam at the bakery before. Um, they're great tools for scraping things off of cookie sheets, uh, off of your bathroom wall. I mean, they're like a perfect multi-purpose tool. Um, both rubber spatulas and many uh, and offset and the mini version of these. Um, are true multi-purpose tools. As for ingredients, I mean, I can't live without butter. I can't live without browning butter, even if I don't have, um, I don't have, even if the store is out of flour, even if I don't have any sugar for some bizarre reason, um, I can use butter and brown butter and make a quick pasta sauce. I can uh, create a, a topping for a, a dessert. It's just like a, a, the flavor of butter is irreplaceable and uh, will always have a special place in my heart. Thanks for having me. I'm going to take a bite into one of my cookies now. Oh, yeah. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious. So good. Do we um, have any more audience questions? Yes, I'm, I'm deeply entrenched in the chat <laughs> right now. Um, who are some of your favorite bakers? Where do you get your inspiration when you're looking to other bloggers, bakers, magazines? Um, I think the renaissance of Bon Appetit in the past, I don't know, 10 years or so um, has been a, a big inspiration, especially when it comes to uh, creating really home friendly cooking that that translates both to high end and sort of home cooks, like I, like I said. Um, uh, Zoe Cannon is, is a, a local baker who's uh, gained a lot of uh, attention for for her inventiveness she was at simon and the whale until until recently she's actually stopped into the bakery which was a a, a great moment and very exciting um another pastry chef natasha pickowitz has sort of come up the ranks with her too i i look up to those women very very much um but in terms of, of food blogs i think i mentioned i just sort of when i was a kid i would i would just sort of empty the spice cabinet and create these like little potions and was sort of obsessed with mixing things together that way and then as i started becoming obsessed with television um i started watching julia child and jacques pepin and then at the around the millennium food networks really started blowing up and i started following anna garten and rachel ray and all those wonderful personalities and those people really taught me how to cook i uh sort of saw what they were doing on tv it was really accessible for me and and i could see what they were doing and i sort of took the the urge that i had to mix things together and sort of applied this newfound knowledge that i found um, and uh, was able to, to sort of actually start cooking. And, and from there, um, I wanted to eat more cake, so I started making cakes. Um, wonderful. Lots of people seem to be having success, so yeah. thank you all for, for joining thank us. For A lot of smelling good right now. Um, how do you feel about pouring brown butter over popcorn? Uh, I mean, like absolute cosine. Yes, do it right now. I want to eat it right now. We have a, a buttered poppy cookie that's coming down the line. It's going to be heavily flavored that way. So, I mean, do it <laughs> right now. Um, how can people support Redgate right now? 
that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, we first and foremost, we have gift cards that are available on our site, and we've been doing a weekly scheduled pickup right now. We launch a uh, a website on, every Monday. Um, we're actually taking this weekend off, but next weekend we'll, we'll resume again. Every Monday, you can place an order until Thursday at midnight, and we have pickups from noon to four on Saturdays. Um, I think as everything sort of starts to slowly reopen, we're going to add a couple more days of, of doing that. It's a good way to, for us to prevent waste and to, and to get food out to, to people who want it. Um, but once we add a couple more days of that, we'll, we'll start opening our doors again uh, for sort of regular business hours and hopefully get back into the swing of things sooner rather than later. Um, one thing that's been really popular in quarantine is our celebration cakes. So mm. we started offering cakes in a six inch size, which seems to be better for a, a few, your quarantine pod. It's a little smaller than a full birthday party, um, but you can order cakes from us. We also have gift cards on our website. We have beanies and tote bags. So there's lots of ways to support from afar. Um, we're working on our shipping program. It's not quite up and running, but feel free to email us and maybe we can figure out. Yeah, if, if the CEO of UPS is watching this right now, which I'm sure he is, uh, please call me. Thank you. Um, I think this might be, well, a lot of questions about culinary school, pastry school. Do you think that's necessary? Obviously you're uh, proof um, of the contrary, but. I think it depends on what you want to do. I, um, like I mentioned, Zoe Cannon and, and Natasha Pickwitz, I have a ton of respect for those women and I look for them for inspiration all the time, but they're also doing something that I'm not particularly interested in. Um, and uh, I think that, that any sort of attention that they garner is absolutely earned, but I'm just looking to, to create things that um, are just much simpler than that. And, for, and because of that, that's why I'm self-taught and that's why I went that route. But um, there are plenty of things that I have no idea how to do, and there are, are many applications for, for those things. And if uh, anyone's looking for more advanced pastry skills, I would absolutely recommend uh, pastry school. I think it's, it's definitely the, the way to go for a lot of people. Um, have you ever tried the toasted sugar method? Do you use that in recipes at all? I didn't even mention Stella Parks before, which I'm sorry if she's watching too, but uh, Stella Parks is, is a great, uh, I mean, I would almost call her a food scientist, but a recipe developer, recipe developer, excuse me, uh, at ser seriouseats.com. She's developed this toasted sugar method, which is very similar to caramelized white chocolate and brown butter, where you roast regular white sugar at a low temperature uh, and sort of move it around so it doesn't melt until it gets sort of a, a, a nutty flavor. Uh, this is sort of the one deviation that I don't really agree with. I don't find a lot of, of, of flavor development in doing that. And it takes a really long time to toast your sugar. So it's not something that I really find worth it. But um, if you have more time on your hands right now and you wanna, wanna try it out for yourself, I would definitely recommend it. I think you just take a bunch of sugar on a baking sheet around 275 or 300 degrees and cook it for about an hour and a half, moving it around every 10 minutes or so until it's sort of evenly golden brown. Awesome. Um, just making sure I didn't miss anything. Lots of questions about how you don't look like a baker based on your waistline. Um, I mean, God bless you, however, asked that. Thank you. Uh, I developed the menu over a long period of time. When I bake something, I taste it and I eat it. I mean, I eat a lot of these cookies all the time. I try to work out and take care of my body as much as I can at the same time. So my weight has fluctuated rat like enormously in the past six months of my life. So thank you for saying that, whoever that was. But no, I, I, I taste what I can and I try to move on as, as quickly as I can. Um, and to everyone asking, yes, we will be emailing out the recipe uh, after this. There'll be a post-event um, list with all the ingredients, proper ingredients with all of the instructions. Um, and lots of questions about if we are sharing any other recipes. The answer is yes. We have a s'mores cake um, on our Instagram is where we do most of our um, sharing of recipes and you can contact us there. So we have the s'mores cake. We just shared our um, toasted brown butter carrot loaf, which was fun for Mother's Day. So that recipe is available. We have our Oreos, which uh, this, this choco toffee recipe was just a warm up for mm. the Oreo project. Um, 
what other ones? We have our caramelized white chocolate stout cake mm -hmm. available. So just, just email us or if you see something else that um, you want to know how to make at home, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, the fudge nutter got a request. We have that recipe. So if you want to just email patricia at redgatebakery.com or Instagram, we can send that recipe over to you. Sure. Um, yeah. DM us on Instagram. We're very friendly, I promise. Just Red Gate Bakery. Yes. And that's where we post all of our online store updates, when, when the bakery is open for pickups. Um, there was one other question about rye flour. Do you ever use rye in baking? Uh, rye and buckwheat and sort of einkorn flour, sort of these ancient grain flours that uh, are, are definitely having a mo moment right now. Um, they'll add a uh, complexity of flavor. Their gluten structure, I think, is 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 pretty similar, it, it, maybe a little less than, than AP flour, but they're going to change the flavor of your cookie pretty dramatically. Um, and they're going to add, a, I know I've said nutty a lot when it comes to brown butter, but they'll add a, a, a real sort of toasted nuttiness to to the cookie itself. Um, as well, but they're great. They're absolutely great to sort of mix and match. I think you can throw in, um, so I would sub about half of your AP flour for another flour or, or combination thereof. Awesome, and the Malden flaky salt that you put on mm. top of the cookies, that's optional, but definitely adds a lot, right? Yeah, it kicks them up a notch, especially, okay, so I learned this uh, a few months ago, some people, some bakeries put salt on the bottom of their cookies because when you eat a cookie, the bottom of the cookie touches your tongue first. Um, I just choose to eat cookies upside down now instead. Uh, but uh, it, it's a good method to sort of get that really punch of salt at the beginning of this followed by the really sweet caramelly cookie that follows. Um, yeah, definitely optional, but I think is, is worth it at the end of the day. Excellent. I don't see any other questions. Oh, what was your favorite part of life at Columbia, Greg? My favorite part of life? Well, obviously my wonderful friends that I got to make while I was there. Um, yeah, I was really grateful at, at Columbia because um, I found a group of friends very early on and, and they've remained friends to this day. And um, I found uh, that there's a pretty tight knit community there um, that I wasn't necessarily expecting. So uh, the friends we made along the way, I have to say. Agreed. Um, we do not have a cookbook yet, but that not might yet. be in the works. Um, and no YouTube show yet either, but... Hey, if any agents are watching right now, call me. Yeah, coming soon. Um, we do post a lot of content, again, on our Instagram. So we'll do like videos of Greg, you know, making strawberry buttercream or the salted caramel brownies like there's there's a lot of food porn going on on our instagram so highly recommend you follow if you loved greg in the kitchen today um and all the other questions in the chat if you i don't want you to feel left out i'll answer them via uh typing um okay let's see um so thank you greg for teaching everyone and bearing with us. Um, also wanted to thank Columbia Alumni Association for having us. It's, it's fun to do this on commencement day. It makes me feel connected again. Um, and the next Columbia at Home program is Making Decisions in Uncertain Times, presented by the Columbia Business School adjunct professor Cheryl Strauss Einhorn. She's a graduate of the School of Journalism. And she'll be in conversation with Columbia Alumni Association board chair and fellow journalism school graduate, Keith Goggin, uh, class of 91. Uh, that will be next Wednesday, May 27th at 7 p.m. You can register at alumni.columbia.edu. Thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you at Redgate once we reopen. And Thank until then, we'll see you on Instagram. Thank you. See you soon.